but take a strong bot lane they wouldn't be able to respond fully but i think it makes the most sense is definitely prioritizing this is it you know scout will take it if you don't uh, and then yeah the narva has been left open obviously pretty strong in terms of a blind especially you know the fact that gwen is off the cards uh and fiora's off the cards as well yeah well the azir as you mentioned just uh to being a pretty high priority in the last draft was banned away by edg in game number one but this time around they do give it over to shanks so not going to be able to have one and of course the felios who was banned as well by edg going to be taken uh, taken by we so getting a bit more stock standard uh laning phases here for we but now you've basically telegraphs how, how your carries are going to perform or who your carries that you want to perform are on the side of Ooh. we so edg they've got options here and the leblanc did just get buffed yeah and it was actually really big buffs uh it was her flat mana mana per level and her w damage and the reason that's so big is because one of leblanc's biggest issues is clearing waves uh they buffed the damage he deals to minions often you'd leave minions at like a little bit of hp and also more mana means you're able to push the wave and still have mana to make a roam so very threatening and although azir's gonna have lane pressure leblanc can often threaten you find kill pressure it's gonna be a very scary lane for shanks now I'm gonna pick up the sivir as well now we they can go and match the jungler here they could go for a top laner like the nar and ban away counters uh but it looks like they are gonna go for that uh Diego here which you know of all the junglers of things like you know the wukong the lee sin of our obviously quite high prior junglers diego is probably the best one into poppy when trundle is banned oh for sure it does feel like the diego with those resets being able to come in and of course the heartbreaker which is uh, a blink not a dash it does mean that you're able to get away from the steadfast presence uh, as such from inside of the poppy but now we start to see a couple of those bands coming in the yumi is a pretty stock standard one now with the nerfs to sustain and of course the buffs to things like scorch as you mentioned earlier on and today the yumi just becomes a and also on the top of something like the sivir just becomes that very obnoxious to deal with champion that she uh, always is and always shall be until she gets completely re reworked but we now looking to see where they want to try to take it we're gonna see a lot of support bands i imagine coming out now karma take it away the alistair i wouldn't even be surprised to see something like the the nautilus as well just things that can do well with the Aphelios and things that can do well with the sivir yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe they throw a top lane pan here if they do want to get rid of something like the Gnar. I feel like the thing, because the thing is, WE could go Gnar blind on four, and then they could counter pick support, which could be powerful. Like, Alistair's the main problem for Sivir because you can't spell shield his combo, but things like the, uh, things like the Nautilus are actually not that effective against the Sivir. So they actually opt to ban the Jax, which is interesting, because he's typically a good matchup in the Gnar. That gives WE even more freedom to take this. And now EDG, they do get a counter pick top lane, but. You know, there's a few top laners banned away, but Fondre always someone to bring out a little bit of the curveballs, and then they have to blind their support, uh, and W will be able to answer. So I think W have handled this draft pretty well so far. I'm just thinking as well for WE, this is a team that has completely, literally put, changed every single position so far this split. We started off with Biu Biu, Beishong, Shie, uh, SMLZ, of course, and... Um, oh okay never mind i was talking about a little bit of a history there for we as they're bringing up a lot of different um uh, uh, different talent from their ldl squad but the yone locked in here for flandre flandre is not deterred from game number one and he is just saying you know what i still think i can beat demon even if he's on the favorable nar yeah i mean i I'm, i respect it honestly and you know i talked about the nautilus not being the best in the sivir eg will just take it themselves and now we there are things you can take here. You could respond with like a Braum or a Tom. Uh, you could actually go for the Renata, which has kind of flown on the radar in this draft. Something to know is Renata did have a base health nerf and a base AD, so not quite as good as she was, uh, which is kind of why the priority has slipped down on her a decent amount, but still very uh, synergizes very well with the Aphelios and should be fine in this laning phase. So they will lock that in. I know there's a lot to talk about here in terms of composition machine, but I want to talk about top lane <laughs> Yep. <laughs> because we have this matchup. And so one of the reasons Nar has been so high priority recently is because of the durability patch. And because normally the bad matchups for Nar are the ones where you can get on top of his mini Nar, you can burst him out he's, when he's very squishy and durability patch obviously made it a lot harder to do so. So even like the rough matchups, things like Jax, things like Camille, win is guaranteed Aurelia as well. We just had 12-14, and on 12-14, they did a fantastic move, which was they nerfed his base health. So he lost a lot of that extra survivability he had in the mini Nar. And sure, Nar is still going to scale very well. Nar is still good in team fights. He's still good in lane. But what it means is those lanes who want to get on top of him, those lanes who want to try and burst him out of mini Nar, are now going to be have a much easier time. I think the exact nerf was 40 base health, and they also uh, nerfed his health for gen growth. So those trades yeah, are going to be 0. felt 5. way more significantly. 
and the yone is that sort of champ you can use your e you can dash forwards uh get a heavy trade on the nar and then you can just pull back you know have that lasting damage on him and if you find the all-in window then you'll take it yeah absolutely it does feel like uh the mini nar is a little bit more vulnerable in the lane and we can see now what Flandre can do with this yone pick and of course you think of something like the yone alongside the poppy a lot of good 2v2 or uh, 2v1 situation with that top jungle combination, but we'll have to wait and see. WB have got themselves some decent options, but like we said the last time, it's just about how you use those options, about how you utilize those picks to make the advantages known to yourself. Yeah, and I feel like this is a more even draft, uh, ultimately, because like I said, I felt like EDG had all the tools they needed in that game one, whereas here, uh, it definitely feels like WB have handled, th handled things better, especially the team fight's going to be really scary because you have the Azir, Plus the uh, Thelios Renata backline. That's a very difficult backline to deal with because they can kind of just outrange a lot of the champions uh, on the side of EDG, right? Sivir is notoriously short ranged, and Azir and Thelios could just deal huge DPS. So if WB get to the team fight point, I have some some confidence in them. And that's not to say they 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 win team fights necessarily because there's lots of ways EDG can play around that. But I think WB have the easier comp when it gets to that point. Whereas EDG. You know, this little bonk in the mid lane. I'm keen to see what Scout can do. And especially as as we've talked about this top lane matchup as well. Yeah, you can see as well the the setup with the minion team and two airlizer. Of course, you wanted to use that to try and get yourself onto the back line. It does mean that you do more damage to the minions, depending on which one you take. You take one of each, and you get more damage onto each of the melee, the cannon, and of course the caster minions as well. It does mean that your distort your onto the backside when you hit, I think it's a level five or six, does end up killing them pretty damn easily. Almost almost immediately, I'm pretty sure. So we'll have to wait and see how that one ends up panning out. Do they get the roam coming out from Scout? And Scout has been just exceptional, honestly, in the last few games. It feels like EDG have been relying on him a little bit, but in a good way as well, because it feels like the rest of the team is kind of being dragged up with him. So curious to see how we end up kind of going in this early game, seeing if Scout can get himself unlocked. And honestly, it's going to be so hard really for WE to find something in this bot side again, because you're against the Sivir. Sivir, even in the early levels, is just going to have perma push with that Ricochet and, of course, the Boomerang Blade when she hits level two. Yeah, hey, AoE on the Ricochet actually got nerfed in 12.14, but even then it still feels like ridiculous. Uh, so there's still powerful. nerfs lined up for a coming at 12.15 just because the problem is, is like, it, it's fine for a champion to scale well. There's a lot of AD carries that scale really well. Oh, don't think you'll find anything more there, Mako. But the problem is when a champion scales well and has such an uninteractive laning phase, if Sivir can just one-shot the waves, then there's not a great way to punish the pick. And she's not at that point, you know, at level one, level two, but eventually she gets to the point where she can be very self-sufficient. It's very hard to engage in her with the spell shield and the ult as well. So EDG kind of just need to weather the storm till there. The support matchup isn't the best. One of the things with the Renata is you can really uh, make it difficult for the uh, Nautilus to engage on you, create a lot of space. Uh, and also Nautilus is notoriously a single target engaged support, right? And if you overcommit, you are quite squishy with that Glacial Augment. You can use the Bailout to turn things around. Yeah, it does feel like when you uh, land that dredge line, you need to be making sure that that works. Well. Actually, curious to see as well, both uh, both the carries taking Ghost in this matchup. So kind of prioritizing the chase down, if you will, of, or even run away uh, effects you get with that extra bit of movement speed. As we see now, JJ, I don't know if you're going to try and maybe make a... Bit of an appearance at each other, but you do not have priority in mid. You're going to see a TP coming in. They're going to flash in, get the knock off. View has nowhere to go. And first blood goes on the JJ. Time and time again, we see why this poppy is the king of the early game. Yeah, really nice execution there from JJ. Flash in, get the slam on the wall. to 1.6 second stun with only one point in it, which is kind of ridiculous. That's such a long stun. Uh, and you can see the damage as well. Uh, the base damage is doubled if you connect them into the walls. So... Just completely slams uh, view. Able to get that first kill. Assist to Flandre as well. Fantastic. We see in the bot lane, uh, Vipe actually ghosted back to lane uh, and picked up a call. So kind of using a bit of the utility of that extra movement speed just to get to lane quicker. But a big reason why we're seeing ghosts in lanes like this is we don't expect too much action. And ghost is one of the strongest scaling runes. Like when it comes to team fights, ghost is really powerful. The fact it resets on sake takedowns, that constant movement speed, very useful. And especially when Siv with Sivir, it syncs so well with your ultimate because one of the changes for Sivir is her ult now refreshes on takedowns. So if you pop ult and ghost, you get a ton of movement speed. You get a takedown, they both keep going and you can just really dictate fights based on that. See how it ends up working out here. So we can see, yeah, Fondre 
using the uh, soul untouched to make sure the demon cannot get a little bit of a hop on top of him when he's going into mega but not but isn't surprising this like, isn't this like Sorry, more accurate yone fighting against demon like is i guess isn't that, yes yeah isn't that what he does there was I, that I, cinematic I, with yasuo and yone right where he fought away that demon so i don't know i'm not an expert on the law but this feels this feels <laughs> accurate it it is definitely something that uh feels correct as such but uh, i'll have to do a bit of digging into that one there beforehand but uh, you never know maybe this time the demon gets the better of him again i'm not 100 percent sure i imagine if yone is uh is still going in uh, in the league of and the league of legends he is uh definitely going to be still uh winning against those matchups but speaking of coming back into reality we can see shanks just kind of getting bullied out to be perfectly honest really hard right now and has to flash away because if jj lands himself the q that's just a dead bird yeah, and I mean, we do see Scout get very low in the trade, but constantly trying to find these angles to get the chains in. You've seen, you know, Mako roam up there. You've seen JJ there. Both times trying to find these opportunities. Now, you see a heavy trade coming out. One of the issues with this matchup is that, you know, when you pop your E on the, on Yone, sorry, is you actually get like movement speed as well. So even if Nar jumps away, Yone can often just catch up to you with that extra movement speed and continue the trade. Uh, so... A little, little bit difficult, a little bit difficult, and we kind of seen why this matchup has been the place. But to be fair, Demon's doing fine so far. It's kind of just mitigate the pressure. We see Flandre TP back up with a Cole and Berserker Greaves. I was just talking about movement speed. That's going to help even more. And often we see like Yone Yasuo get early Berserker Greaves for that lower Q cooldown. I just had an idea. I don't think it would ever work, but it, maybe in LCK it would. Uh, it's a little bit of a shot at them, but it actually wasn't intended to be. But uh, you could do like like lore readings mid cast if there was absolutely nothing to talk about you could just like like literally take a story and you know it's like the boy ran with a dead sprint that kind of stuff you know make it all like uh, atmospheric make an audiobook almost a little bit be kind of fun sure <laughs> <laughs> i feel i feel like you're not the person i need to pitch this to because you're a very like into the game kind of guy so like i feel like you're not as interested in the lore as i am okay i, I mean, mean there's plenty I, I of people who are <laughs> i have a passing interest in the lore like this is I, interesting I have, cinematics I have, but I, my my friend is super into it. he reads all the stories he uh he like basically like brings them all down and everything like that for me so i can have like understand them in my small brain but uh they're good. There's some good stuff. It's hard to know what's like fully canon though, and like what's old canon, what's new canon. It's hard to kind of tell sometimes, you know. Yep, I just stick to you know what I know, and that's on the rift. <laughs> we do see W going for pretty heavy invade here under this red, and they might be contested. There's a lot of members here from EDG. Yeah, a lot of people here. Is W maybe have got a little bit too far forward? Is he got Flandre coming in there with the fate oh, seal? Has to so go straight good. back. That was a great ultimate from Shanks. Just a completely disengaged situation. And WE, they continue out with their lives. Oh, that honestly looked like it was going to be fantastic for EDG. You had Scout on one flank, Flandre on the other. I was like, this is... You're paying heavily for that red buff. And then Shanks just says no. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And now able to disengage. We see Demi get a plate in the top side as well. All positives, but Scout actually roaming up. If the chain hits... Oh, but he doesn't go for it. Doesn't step any further. There is a pink ward there. Just making sure that uh, Demon keeps himself honest and make sure he does not get caught out. We'll say Flandre getting himself a coal seems to be his uh, new favorite thing on the top side. Go for a trade, get back, get coal, and then see how the rest of the game goes. But uh, it's stacking it up fairly nicely, fairly quickly. As uh, WE now going to have themselves the opportunity to take down the Rift Herald here. So honestly, with the push they have, it is a decent move. But EDG, they're not going to take this one quietly. Yeah, they are in position to respond to this one. Do you see AD carries moving up? WE's AD carry is there. Oh Ooh, my god, that's so big. That's massive. And that's just as easy as it is. Thank you for the leash. Scout oh, gets himself my... the Rift Herald. That was just unfortunate. And again, why Poppy is so revered, why Poppy is considered the number one jungler right now is because you just get access to stuff like that. You don't want to fight, but you want the Rift Herald? Cool, she does it. I mean, Poppy all is so broken. For, for anyone who's wondering why we're seeing so much Poppy recently, I mean, there was the buffs to the tank mythics, which definitely helped. The meta shift, sure. But, like, the big buffs that made her so strong came before MSI. And one of them was that her ult knocks people further away and the, the missile speed is higher. So it's harder to dodge. And you just end up so far away. It's like you are out the fight. And it's just so hard to deal with. Like, I was saying, WE, they had favor in that fight. Shing was already there. Viper wasn't yet. It was going to be a 5v4. And then Poppy just says, no, it's a 4v3. And W were like, cool. Well, 
I guess. We do everything right, but we left Poppy open so we don't get the Herald. Yeah, it's it's hard to counterplay that kind of a thing, to be perfectly honest. It just feels uh, a little bit unfair. And uh, sadly for WE, they lose another objective. They've yet to take an objective at all, by the way, be it a tower or a neutral in this series right now. Didn't get one in game one. So far, at 10 minutes gone, they're not getting one yet in game number two. Gdaya, though, and Mako just having a bit of a supportal combat. Uh, uh, try to see support will come up moment for the vision, uh, but yeah. good good moves here from EDG to make sure they're not getting caught up by any flank wards. I feel like we're gone that objective point. This is what I expect to kind of to be when you have these, especially stronger teams against weaker teams. Is like the objectives are stronger, right? That's just how it is, yeah. right? Dragons all buff, heralds have been buffed. You get the local gold. The second one's bigger. The expectation is if teams can. They won't want to trade. They will be greedy and they will put as much resources as they can into securing these neutrals. And that's kind of what we saw game one. We're expecting game two and a demon. Oh, he flashes, but now he has no real escape. He does not have a bounce and he does not have a life. Flandre picks that one up for himself and you can see just how vulnerable that mini nar is. Those nerfs really hitting hard. Yeah, the nerfs, but also ganks. Kind of painful, just in general. Now Flandre should be able to pick up a plate here. It's actually built up a pretty sizable CS lead now. View is going for this dragon. EDG are going to contest, though. They, they As I it. said, they're being greedy. They don't want to give anything over to WE. Yeah, they're trying their best right now. You can see Shing now with a TP coming in as well. That's going to be Shanks on the back side of this one here. But, ooh, the distortion on the view. He, yep, that's enough. He can't go back in on top of this, as well as Mako having access to his ultimate. Very difficult for you to really walk up and just take this. So, EDG, they're having their cake and they're eating it. They're being greedy, greedy boys, but they're getting rewarded for it. I noticed they don't continue the dragon, right? It did reset, it did heal up a bit, but regardless, they don't want to get trapped in the pit trying to take down this dragon that's so much beefier. They just want to stop WE from doing it, and they'll leave it until they are ready to start up the dragon. Herald comes down mid, ton of gold for scout and pressure on that mid tier one, which is very important against the Zier, who's great at defending those towers. And I mean, Golden Old Blanc is always going to feel rough when you're going up against it. The gold lead is 2,300 now, and I feel like it's pretty evenly spread across the board. Yeah, it does feel like everyone's kind of getting their little bit there as well. I will say in bot lane, WE having a, a bit of a window to maybe find an opportunity. They have got about a 20 CS lead for the Aphelios, which is very, very nice as we come up into 12 minutes into the game. But very difficult to see them kind of really... Honestly, it, it's that thing of like you're relying on your solo laners, the Nar and the Azir, to start your fights off. You don't really have a good tank engage or maybe you're kind of like waiting for the rest of EDG to run into you and then you have to catch them out with the uh the hostile takeover you've got yeah. a lot of you got a lot of uh i suppose um situational cc to kind of come in here for we that's kind of how you want to play it like what's going to be really important for we is when you're up for neutrals is being there first if you get there on the objective and EDG have to come to you that's where a lot of these tools can be very powerful right you can have demons stacked up with meganar waiting on a flank uh, if they have to run into like the hostile takeover into an Aphelios, into Azir, very difficult to deal with. Speaking of difficult to deal with, Demon might be getting kind of threatened here, but it's about to go Mega, so I think they'll just back out. Yeah, it looks like w or EDG just wanted to try and get that Mega out of them as soon as possible, and they're kind of saying, cool, now you are exhausted after this. We will see WE, though, starting up the Dragon again. This time around, they will get it, so congratulations again to get their spells, their first objective of the game. But you can see JJ really trying to put Demon in a hole right now, forces out the ultimate from him, and JJ, he's going to get run down a little bit, but honestly, this is totally fine because you're just trading it for power into the Yone time, and also, more importantly, just gold into this Mega carry in the top side. Yeah, and the thing with the, the Mount Soul is like the 9% is, is okay early, but it often comes in stronger later in the game when you build your own resistances. Oh no, Demon. Yeah, he went back in. He wanted to try and make this one work for himself, but uh, sadly, the Demon shall be slain, and that's going to be Flandre being uh, lore accurate as far as myself and Ox are concerned on this Yone. Yeah, so much gold, but it, oh, oh my no. god, they're looking for more. Yeah, view. He flashes and gets flashed in the top of him. I don't know why we're going bot side, though. It's going to be a moonlight vigil. Kadaya, though, gets a really nice hostile takeover coming out. The exhaust came out straight onto Viper, but look at these red and white guns going forward. Shing almost gets himself two kills, and that's WE's win condition right there. Yeah, perfectly done. The thing is with the the Sivir, you are short range, but if you get up close to Aphelios with red and white, you will just get decimated now. EDG are going to get the first tower here. This Yone is monster fed, but at least WE will be able to answer back in the bot lane. And Shing has a farm lead, has that tower taken, and nearly, very nearly could have picked up a second kill there on Mako as well. 
we'll see the replay and yeah they think they found kadaya but this is kind of the problem so many tools to turn things around you get the damage coming through uh kadaya does flash out and then shang he's ramped up he's got the shurikens and actually i think one more auto if he was able to get it off would have killed mako but didn't want to go into tower didn't want to risk it huge play coming out and a little bit of hope for wh they definitely need in this situation yeah they needed something to go right and right now that is bot lane for them so they got themselves a dragon it's very late so we are not going to be seeing soul for a very very long time if early is probably 28 minutes maybe even a little later so it is going to be a difficult one there for we to try and make that a win condition for themselves at the moment but We'll see if they can maybe make something work in those team fights. Fight around that Rift Herald. Fight around. Excuse me, not Rift Herald. Yeah, sorry. The Rift Herald has spawns. They could maybe fight around that, but definitely a difficult situation for them to find themselves in. And honestly, you're looking at Flandre. You see the Yone. You're probably thinking, huh, why isn't he building crit? That's what Yone's do. It's actually a new build that's been coming out. We see the Blade of the Ruin King into something like a Sunfire, maybe even a Frostfire Gauntlet, depending on which one you want to try and go for. It's just been the build right now for this pick. Yeah, it's because you do so much damage, but you're bulky enough that you can even be like, you can engage, right? Because one of the problems with Yone is if you like ER in, you'll just get popped before you can do anything. But this build makes you bulkier. In the longer fight, you still do a ton. And it's going to be problematic in the side lane. I expect it'll probably be the Frostfire just because Sunfire got nerfed on 12-14. Uh, it now scales more with bonus health and has a lower flat burn, which they did to try and stop people building it. But we saw Frostfire as well, and particularly into the Gnar, it gives you a ton of sticking power. And that's kind of what you need in the Yone Gnar matchup. So I expect that, but we'll see how it ends up coming out. Regardless, both teams posturing around mid. We do have the Herald in pocket for JJ, and I think WE sense that the game plan for EDG is to try and get that mid tier one, and they want to try and prevent it if possible. Uh, but I don't know if you really can. This Herald's going to get slammed down. Remember, it's super tanky now. 75% more HP, uh, 9,000 HP. You're not killing that before it gets off the charge. And it's probably just going to get a second charge as well. Yeah, still 3,000 on it there. Maybe we'll get the second charge as the rest oh, of the don't defend just, it. Yeah, they don't defend it. So uh, the eye gets exposed. You poke it in the eye with the Blade of the Ruin King that the Viego has. But now scout gets an opportunity when everyone with premium bots are mid side to try and push in bot lane so we're kind of hitting towards that mid game now where everyone's picking up their first items as shing he's feeling very confident honestly this guy could end up being the reason that w were able to kind of sneak a win here they are 1-0 down of course they are knocked out of playoffs at 0-12 oh. but your fate has been sealed shing and you have nowhere to go flandre's just too damn big yeah i mean i understand the thought process from shang like wanting to burn stuff from viper but you know you traded your ghost there you used your ult you only got the ult from viper maybe if kadai was there to give you the bailout uh it would have given you the extra attack speed and movement speed towards enemies i don't know but regardless you burn all your tools you burn your gale force and it just exposes you to be punished and that kind of feels like the weight of w's expectations like we're talking about it shang needs to be the carry so he tries to go for a big carry play and it just backfires yeah, just walks a little bit too close to the sun. Flandre, 60 CS up, by the way, on uh, onto Demon. So I'm thinking that this Gnar is uh, not as blindable as maybe people think. There's no Sunfire Aegis, so we were talking about the nerfs coming in, but not to be deterred right now. Flandre just wants the uh, the straight-up tank stats. Doesn't, or even the damage as well, that ramps up as well. So uh, we'll see if he wants to go a little bit of a tankier build, because, of course, it does scale. The damage does scale with the amount of HP you have, so... Let's see what they're able to kind of go for right now as EDG just kind of position themselves around this dragon. It is another cloud dragon, so that's going to be a nice little bit of extra stats for yourself, especially when you're trying to roam around the map. Yeah, and we do see W posturing. They really want to contest this one. Let's scout. scout on the flank. If he if he chunks out Shang, it doesn't even matter if he kills him or not. I don't think W can fight because EW are trying to move on the objective. As I said before, so important that they get positioning but Demon, he's mega too soon. Oh, flash in. JJ Shing has been caught, has been knocked up. He's in the bounce house right now. Does get the bailout and maybe able to kill off Viper and keeps themselves alive. That means Shing is still putting out DPS. Shing is still doing damage. It's going to be on Flandre to make this fight work as Scout finally finishes off the Aphelios. But this fight has gone very right for WE as EDG. They got two confident orcs. Ma they just overstepped, right? Demon was hitting Mega and I was like, they can just wait this out. No, they engage with Mega now there. And this is the power of the Renata. Just, it feels so insane how long Shing survived there. Didn't even have his flash available, I believe, during the fight. And yet, he managed to get the bailout proc. They managed to get the fight. They managed to get the dragon. WE, they're still in this game. They've got a win condition. You've got two dragons now stacked. You've got Earth, Wind, and Fire coming out for yourself, as we can see this replay. Like you said, the Mega's been proc. They can just wait this. They don't have to go on to Shing. And look, the... 
hostile takeover fantastic coming out from Kadaya, oh, but also shing goes into the bailout but just walks up to viper and kills him then look how long he survives after that dodges away from flandre dodges the q and the flandre gets janked back before he dies yes he does eventually go down but so much time so much effort was invested into him Shing honestly played that one about as well as you could. Him and Kadai are doing a fantastic job. And the rest of the team was just there to clean up and shanks as well. This is Zia, one of those super scalers, getting this shutdown. I think it was 750 gold total he got here. Yeah. So a big influx. And sure, you got to bear in mind, WE is still 4k gold down after losing that. Uh, sorry, after winning that fight. But the fact they have that second dragon means Soul is miles away for EDG. And it definitely gives them some hope in these fights absolutely and this is the thing as well we talked about the ghost being a uh, a great scaling rune but the ghost doesn't really give you an immediate kind of you know health buff or a cleanse to get rid of cc it's very much a you know a kiteable how you position yourself kind of choice and we can see oh jj not exactly the best of ultimates there and that's going to be the mid lane tier one going down so all of a sudden this game is getting a little bit dicey here for EDG, and from a such a confident game one, WE they've got some uh, got some uh, you know kind of uh, I suppose complaints from that game. They've honestly just built themselves a, a much better situation than they did in game one. Yeah, one issue though is we do see EDG kind of lean on the side lanes quite a bit. LeBlanc is better suited to side laning than Azir is, and also this top lane matchup. That you know part of the reason the gold discrepancy is so big is there's a 60 CS lead between the top laners, right? You have this. There's Yone who can basically just duel Demon whenever he wants, as long as he can get on top of him. And so as a result, that that could be an avenue which EDG can pursue if they can leverage the side lane pressure well and potentially lean in and look for picks. That is something they can do. Because I think, you know, that is that is strength of the composition. Very good at finding picks, very good at using the mobility, you know, of the Yone and the Blanc, even the movement speed of like Poppy uh, and Sivir. But in the 5v5, if WE is set up correctly, they should be able to, to outperform. So we'll see how that manages to pan out for now. EDG is trying to defend on this top side. There's no actual real objective they're fighting for because I don't think Baron's really on the card right now. But trying to maybe look for a pick here. I was going to say, JJ doesn't have flash yet. So if he gets handshake back, but he would uh, definitely be in a bad situation. And this is the thing now. That you're gonna have to try and deal with as 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 EDG, I should say. You don't really have the best of control and because it's an infernal rift. It makes it a lot harder for you to just control areas. It's a lot easier for the side of WE to get into those little crevices of fog of war and just put down that little extra bit of vision. And now you can see with the pickup of the Banshee's Veil for Shanks, he is actually in a very powerful position against scouts. He's not really going to be bursting out anytime soon. And this is where the game gets, again, a little bit scary. I feel like Flandre is going to have to make something work. The fact that he's two levels ahead of Demon is going to be your win condition in these side lanes. So all eyes on Flandre. Yeah, and I mean... Part of the issue is this is why we don't see that much split pushing anymore. You know, there it is there, right? But a lot of the times you still have to join the team fights because just neutral objectives are so strong. The threat of the, the uh, Infernal Soul is going to force EDG to fight in a minute 20. And it's not just the threat of that, it's the extra stats. The fact they've already got 9% armor MR, 7% out of combat movement speed, and slower resistance. Uh, and on top of that, if they start getting those Infernals, like if they get two Infernals with the Soul, that's 12% AD and AP. And obviously the soul to boot is just going to make things so hard for EDG. So they're trying to get there really. This is the big thing, right? They're moving into the area first, which is going to make it harder for WE to contest. And they're trying to potentially fish for a pick if they get a window or an opportunity. You got an Nautilus and it's time to go fishing. Yeah, maybe a hook onto view would be a great start to this one here. 45 seconds till the dragon spawns. You have got the Randuin Zoma now finished up for Demon as a second item comes out as well for Shing. So you're at a pretty decent power spike here across the board for WE and they don't want to waste any time. They go straight forward in, but Scout keeps them away. You do have the Shirelia's Revelry being popped and that's not going to be available for you anymore. The legacy of Shirema does get taken out. Oh, oh Shing's Shing. Shunked out by the LeBlanc. This is all Scout has to do. You mentioned it in the last fight. All he has to do is keep himself on the backside and be a nuisance. Yeah, and with Shing Chong's Demon's Mega already procced. Oh, they're looking oh, for a pick. That was so nice from Demon. He didn't have to overcommit, but now he does anyway. He's going to go in. There's the hostile takeover coming out. It's going to land onto the Sivir. We got Flandre TPing in. The Fate Seals lands onto absolutely nobody, but Demon's already gone down. You've lost one of your teammates here. Now, as you can see, Scout feeling confident as he flashes in and lands the chains onto Kadaya and brings him straight down to hell. EDG, they were a little bit tentative, but they finally found an opportunity and WE overstepped. And you can see the difference, you know, when EDG are funneling into WE's backline, WE 
you know performed the last team fight fantastically but here they feel desperate the reason they feel desperate is the meganar was timing out flandre was pushing the top lane oh, oh shanks oh don't land the chain on the scout so uh yeah. sadly I will not continue my point <laughs> uh, they ended up feeling desperate because flandre was pushing the top lane so they overforced they try and engage and it just left their backline exposed the tp that came in and sure flandre's ult didn't connect on a shin because he flashed but everything was so messy so disrupted uh, and we'll see that one again so yeah this is the pressure like chunked out uh ad carry meganar procced yun in the top lane all these things compound the pressure onto we so they force this play and although it, it's a nice trick over the wall stun mako buffers the q to gain some distance <laughs> And then turns around the AoE damage. And then here, you know, you've used a lot of your cooldowns. Hostile takeover gone. And the Yone gets in exactly where he needs to be. I think that uh, that little trick play with the ultimate was actually unintentional. Because uh, I didn't notice it the first time we were watching it. But he flashed and failed the flash over the wall. And then had to use it. And that's why we ended up seeing him in a little bit of a, a fun little situation for himself. But the end of it all, Demon sadly did die. Third item now picked up for Flandre as the Yone is starting to really become just such a, a monster. Uh, nearly 100 CS. It is 90, or sorry, 85 CS now in favor of Flandre in that side. And it's only getting harder. It's only getting worse. Yeah, and he has gone for that Kenpunk Chainsaw. So we're talking a bit about how the Sunfire skills better with HP. It went from 1% bonus health to 1.75% the damage it deals. So getting a bit, of, a bit of best of both worlds, right? A lot of AD and some health on that Kenpunk Chainsaw. And it just basically means this would be such a force to be reckoned with. He's now picked up a BF and a stopwatch. So going towards a GA just makes his team fighting even better. And WE feels like it's kind of sinking in. You know, they're yeah. starting to feel a little bit desperate. Yes, they have scaling elements on the team. But Yone, uh, Sivir, LeBlanc as well. Those, champ those champs lean pretty well in the later stages. And if EDG continue to out-execute, uh, they will struggle. Yeah, I think the big thing now is uh, despite the cost nerf onto uh Kempunk chain sword it only got increased gold uh, increased cost by 200 i believe uh it's still an exceptionally powerful stat stick of an item that just gives you so much good just all around stats in general and now we'll see now what the uh the one wants to go for and honestly who could deal What's with crazy because, go on is that it, it's 500 gold less than death stance and it gives the same ad and that's post nerf right yeah um, and I'm sure, like, I'm not, I'm not going to discredit it and say, oh, Death Dance is a weak item or something. Death Dance is insane. And it gives all the other stuff, right? Death Dance gives armor and the, the healing when you get a takedown and the, the true damage that gets mitigated. Don't, don't get me wrong. But just, like, in terms of, like, raw numbered stats, item is pretty nutso. Yeah. It is, uh, if you can afford it and reasonably get it within your team's comp, that is a pretty good item to get. And honestly, another reason why it fits into Yone and Yone being fitting into this kind of composition that you've built here because just so difficult to really kind of keep them down honestly edg they're in a great position now to be able to start start this up you have a poppy you have a yone with a blade of the ruin king you, and a crack and slayer saver you will shred this there's actually nothing that we could do about it unless they get themselves in the pit they've even lost demons mega oh they're trying to fight though they are looking for the fight mako taken very very low we are going to see a good everfrost the hostile takeover doesn't really land onto anyone shanks reset and was looking for maybe a, a TP in as he does finally pick up his Rabadon's death cap. So we are starting to hit critical mass here for the big WE carries. There are opportunities for them when they get onto three items onto the Aphelios as well. So this is where the game starts to get a little bit more down to execution. But it does feel like EDG are still in control. Yeah, I mean, they, they set the pace of the game. Did get a little bit messy there. Mako nearly going down. But they're able to survive. I think what's important, though, is that no one on WE actually burned anything, right? They didn't actually burn a TP to come over. They didn't burn any summoners. I feel like that's what EDG were trying to do, is they're trying to fish for something, right? If they got a summoner, you know, or maybe a bit of kill. The Baron felt a bit risky. They're not going to flip it when you can just ult in. But they managed to burn a summoner before this dragon fight would have gone a long way. So nice patience from WE. And it's actually, I think, Viper who been uh, the Ghost and Mako who been Flash. So those summoners not available for this one. Importantly enough, though, EDG, you can actually see a TP coming in the bot lane from uh, Flandre trying to use this pressure in the side lane and just sweep through, get control of this area. And now WE, they go, look, we probably can't approach this dragon. Let's just go to Baron. 
Yeah, they gotta try and force something. This will be the second dragon for EDG, but it's not gonna happen just yet because he's still up 20 seconds. You're a little bit early on this particular push here as Demon does have himself ultimate, but Mako is very well aware of this. 5,000 health on the Baron, but immediately WE burn off because they know that their top laner is in trouble. He's got the bail out, but he doesn't get himself back onto the map. The exhaust comes out on the Flandre as he goes straight back up into his soul. So nothing really there for WE. You can see they wanna try and find out Mako. They may have done it. The execute not quite landing there. Eventually it comes out and it's all just all over the place right now it's scrappy as hell as Flandre finds himself between a rock and a hard place but it's Shing who goes down Scout's taking over this game he's breaking ankles right now just doing so well and eventually it ends up being a 5 for 3 and EDG get the ace Man, Shing did so much there. Over 7,000 damage from the Aphelios, but it's just not enough. It's not enough because you couldn't kill Flandre. And Scout is there till the end and able to clean up. Now, do you think that I, we expect to see Flandre just run over towards the dragon and pick that up himself? Well, we'll get the replay. And Demon, I understand the attempt, but Mako does the correct thing. He face checks, he wards. His fate is not as important. This ult doesn't really achieve much, despite for even spell shielding it. So instantly, this is a bad start to the fight. But from here... I want you to track Shane. Does mess up a bit with the dash there, but the damage he does here with the red blue guns, the AoE available, uh, actually ends up being pretty insane. We initially get the fight start in here, the focus comes down onto uh, the Azir, and then Shane just starts absolutely shredding everyone nearby when they're clumped up. Pops the Q with the red gun and just spams that AoE flamethrower, but unfortunately, Scout is there just to clean it up. Yeah, Scout is popping off in this game. And honestly, in this series, it feels like this is a, a pretty good performance there from the World Championship winning mid laner. And honestly, it just feels like EDG are getting back control of this game. And it does feel like it's off of really good play. I think WE made the best choice they possibly could. Now Mako's gone way too far wow. forward. He gets thrown about the place. It's like a ragdoll effect in a video game. Just like, whoa, all over the shop. And he's eventually <laughs> killed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing you gotta be careful of. Mako is not tanky as this Nautilus. Uh, and he just gets absolutely, oh, slick from view. Ooh. Dodges away from the ultimate of the Yone. And with that down, with the support available, this might be WE looking Scout. to make this happen. This feels like a good setup because, you know, it forces CDG to come into them, but Scout, Scout. over the wall is so threatening. He's so threatening right now. He's going to see if he can get it maybe himself over there, but a good smite comes out from actually no smite from WE. They just get it off of a damage alone. Demon going to give away his life, but WE, oh, can just, they take the fight out, afterwards? Just, get out. just leave. View has to give himself up. You've given up two. You still have three Baron Buffs. This is still good from the side of WE, but Flandre's not quite done. He knows he has a GA, and he knows he's got an opportunity to maybe find somebody out. He will eventually get pushed back. And it looks like EDG will live to fight, or sorry, WE will live to fight another day, but they will probably lose this tier two in mid. Yeah. Uh, do you see that blue buff? Yes, it's a, it's a visual glitch. He's just, uh, he's just <laughs> oh, showing. No, it's, it's, oh, it's there fixed, we go. It's fixed, there it's we fixed. go. Yeah, it was pulled away from the Solaris. Yeah, I mean, that fight basically, JJ was obviously trying to ult away the jungler, but ended up hitting Shang. Oh, Shang's good stopwatch. Good stopwatch, but it means the aggro doesn't go over onto Flandre, so you're losing two tier twos on this push right now that you got the Baron from, so you've actually lost two and a half thousand gold since you actually picked up the Baron, so not yeah. exactly ideal for WE. Yeah, another best spot to be in. We'll see the replay, and I mean, essentially, this is a, a scary position to be in, but JJ, I think his aim was obviously to ult view out so he, he couldn't smite, but he ends up hitting Shing. Or maybe he's just going for Shang. Or maybe he's going for the steal with the damage from the ultimate. Regardless, he knocks AD carry out. And WE are like, right, well, we can't fight without our AD carry here. View doesn't have ult or flash, so he's stuck. And Kataya just says, you're on your own, buddy. So I think it's the right call, but the cost is pretty severe. You can see the top right screen. Minus 1,000 gold on that Baron play. And you can definitely say, well, at least by them getting the Baron, they deny it from EDG. But it's still not exactly the outcome you want. No. And EDG... You know, we were talking about the soul being very late in the game. There's two dragons already secured for them. And that's 12% extra AD and AP. They're looking at another one in two minutes. And if they start stacking those up, it's going to be a ridiculous amount of extra stats. Especially when you have, like, full build on this Yone. You have uh, LeBlanc with uh, Rabadons and a Medjize and 14 stacks. It's going to become problematic. Yeah, four item server. We're we're at the point now where this is a super late game coming out here from both these sides, and you have plenty to be working with here as EDG. But WE not to be on, not to be deterred just yet. We will see a fate seal coming out, landing on the two. There's going to be the ultimate there from JJ to try and just dissuade any kind of real engage. Demon does go into mega. 
But they won't be able to get this turret. This is the big problem now with the poppy that you have available to you. Because his scout wasn't even a part of that. That was effectively a 4v5. A scout's just being a nuisance. I love seeing scout on this LeBlanc pick. Because he's just picking such great positions to be in. Because even if you see him, then you know he's there. You have to respect it. You have to back away. Yeah, the angles are so good. And that's the thing with LeBlanc. It's so hard to punish her on the flanks to pin her oh down. God. See scouts looking for something here. And WE are quite low. Yeah, they're going to see them look for something here. The Everfrost, not quite good enough. A scout did get rooted up. But again, the distortion's just too good. A minute now until the next dragon spawns. That will be three Infernal Drakes for EDG. And you did it. You're looking at a Medjai's Rabadon's LeBlanc, a, a full item Yone. This is not something you can just walk into anymore. You will just get deleted. But the same as can be said on the other side. I will say that you've got plenty of damage now onto this Azir and, and, and onto this Aphelio. So I think Shing and Shanks, they've got to be the big guys right now. They've got to step up for their team and make something happen if WE want to try and come out of this with a 1-1. It's going to come down to execution. WE have your standard front to back, whereas EDG are looking for that backline access, looking for the flank angles, looking for Scout and Flandre to get effectiveness. You'll see those ults they used earlier back up pretty quickly. You only with the extra ability haste gets that soon. And also, oh, nice poke on a JJ actually. Get him to half health. You can start to see, like, even the tanks don't feel so tanky anymore. Oh, view is dead. View what? is dead. You do uh, not have a jungler. And uh, that's a big problem now. Now Shing needs to go straight on the Viper. And he's feeling oh confident. God. What a great play from the AD carry of WE. They trade it back one for one. But again, you don't have your jungler and scouts on the backside of this fight. Looking to see if Demon can maybe make something work. He's got himself mega very, very soon. Ooh, it's a bit of a close one. And Viper has been silenced right now. Shing has been popping off. And the thing is, the dragon is 13k HP. They can't just rush it down and smite it. WE are ready to fight them. They're looking for it, but uh, EDG are going to try and wait out the Mega, Shanks. I would think. Oh, Scout! Oh, Scout! Guys get caught out, but he ends up going back to his distortion now. JJ is dead, and this is going to be sole point now. Unless Flandre can really go for the steal right now, it's going to be difficult. The Fate Seal, not quite enough. And that's going to be sole point for WE. They are not done just yet. And Ox, this game has no right being this good of a banger. Shing is doing so much. I mean, the fact... Viper, world champion, reigning world champion, AD carry. Someone we always give so much praise. Literally just hunted down and deleted by WE's AD carry. Flandre's looking for an angle here. And Scout, I feel like I don't even have to say it anymore. He's always on a flank, right? Yeah. So have to respect that <laughs> is, and be cautious. Is Scout of in the game? Yes, then flank is correct. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just how it is. I think they'll go for a reset off the back of this. But, you know, they get some extra stats, but they also get closer to the soul denied away. A long passage of play here. So let's break it all down. Scout finds a fantastic angle here onto view. Just manages to land the change as soon as he comes over. And then using the QR, deletes him. And then Shing, he knows that EDG will be confident. Goes forwards with the Gale Force. And because he moves so fast, the Nautilus Assault can't keep up with him. It doesn't knock him up before he kills Viper. <laughs> kind of hilariously. Even had the flash as well, by the way. He didn't even need the flash to take him down. So... Beautiful execution from WE on that one. Uh, still down in gold, but I think at this point, right, Flandre's been full build for a while. Scout is full build. The gold is starting to have less and less relevance. I mean, you're at full items almost for your AD carry and mid laner for WE. And now EDG, like you said, it comes down to execution view. A third of his HP. He needs to be very, very afraid of this LeBlanc on the sidelines. He is three levels. Actually, I think he's four levels down on the LeBlanc right now. And you can see now the call from EDG. Try burn this one down, but never mind. We're going to go for a full engage. It's Demon! Straight back to hell with you. Flandre goes in with the Fate Seal, but he hasn't really got a place to go afterwards. He ends up getting himself backed out. Still has the GA available to him. You've lost your top lane. You've lost your real big engage. It's kind of down to Shanks to make something happen. Now as WE, they know they're strong, but they need to make sure they execute properly. Yeah, they're cheaping Flandre back in so he can heal up. WE still know they have to fight this one out, and they know Scout is a problem. Yeah, they know Scout is a problem. They know Scout is up on this top side. The Baron down to 6,000 HP as we might see them just try and go for this one straight away. JJ doesn't want to go for the flip right now. They're going to see them flash in on top of Shanks who goes golden to keep himself alive. As you can see, oh, the double distortion. It's huge damage as WE finally get themselves away. Good trigger, hap or good tr trigger discipline from Shing as he doesn't pop his flash. But look at these health bars, Ox. Everyone's just so close to dying. It is literally coming down to execution in these fights. Man, it just feels like everyone is squishy. Like, we actually have some tanky champions in this game, but, like, Demon got obliterated. JJ just feels like he gets, like, shredded in a, in a millisecond, and, like, you saw the damage Scout did, and yet, despite that huge AoE damage from Scout, 
Shing and Shang's kind of just look to EDG and match the damage. And it, it ends up just being full resets from both sides. Now, the reason EDG is so focused on this Baron is if they leave it two minutes, you have the potential for flipping the whole game on that soul. If you give soul over WE, that may be the edge. And you once they have it, they have it for the rest of the game. So they're trying to force around here. Demon just ends up overstepping. Isn't as tanky as he thinks he is. And doesn't, I think he had a stop watching inventory. Doesn't use it in time. But like, watch this moment here. Scout gets a massive combo in. But the turn... Oh, we don't get time. The turnaround no. damage was just absolutely insane. Now, Shanks is resetting. He has TP. I think he has Void Staff completed, so he should be full build. Uh, but we don't Maybe. get to see if he finishes it. But now, Demon... Oh, I'm scared for him. Yeah. I mean, you can see that. Like you said, there are tanky champions. But even Demon only lasts a couple of seconds in these fights right now. The server is going... Yeah, if if that. That's asking for a lot as well. Shanks loses Banshees. That's all Scout wanted for the moment. But may have stepped a little bit too far. His distortion should be up in about two seconds. And he should be able to keep himself oh safe. Lord. And that means that he loses his passive. And that's actually a big cooldown. It is only about 40 seconds. But that's 40 seconds now that WE have without no, with, with knowing there's not going to be any illusion smoke or mirrors. Yeah, and the fact he's chunked out, he has to reset, and he loses his positioning. The big thing is that, like, Scout's positioning is the most threatening thing, so if you force him away, it makes a big difference. You've seen the Azir damage now, and even just like that, Inferno Morto, just, just far too much. I feel all oh, the old comes Ooh. down, he's chunking them, they go over the Baron. They go over the Baron, but they're going to knock away Bye. Shanks. You don't have him, you don't have him anymore in this one. Shanks, though, is the primary target view, just tries to get himself with the ultimate in the way of Scout, and now you've reset. EDG muscling themselves back into this Baron pit as the Baron does reset. We are in weird territory right now, Ox. Neither team's going for but 26 seconds till that Infernal Soul spawns, and you can see EDG, that's the call. Yeah, they're heading straight over. They will have positioning on this. Even saw Shane ghosted to run back to the team fight. He's that far away. But now, WE don't have good setup for this objective. They don't need this dragon. If it goes over to EDG, it's not the end of the world. But it's not good. And I think they're just not in position to do so. So they're heading towards this Baron. Scout is playing interruption. They just have to do it. They have to rush it. They have to rush it, but you can see EDG, they don't want to give this one up because they know that the extra range, they won't be able to deal with it right now. Demon, there's a lot of damage. He's already down below half HP as the rest of EDG are here. This dragon, forget about it. Don't worry about it, Ox. We're not going to talk about it right now. It's all about the big purple lady now as we look to see who can take the Baron. Both WE and EDG not willing to let this one go as both teams look to reset. You have TP available for Demon as maybe he looks to try and contest for this dragon, but there's no wards, there's no minions. It looks like EDG will be able to fight for another five minutes. EDG do a good job. They manage to not only stop the Baron, but also ensure they still get that dragon as well. And now, three Infernal Dragons, 18% AD and AP. Oh I look at that LeBlanc, that's an insane amount of extra damage uh, that is going to be afforded. Stacking dragons, like the individual dragons themselves, so much more severe now with them being buffed. Uh, and we do see WE once again moving towards that Baron, trying to make a fight happen. You gotta do it once. What's oh, the first to do? Demon's keeping in. He has Mega. Keep, yeah, they got Mega. And the Baron's gone, but Demon and me, that was the literal frame perfect flash I've ever seen. He must have been spamming that as he came out of the teleport. But now Mako maybe caught out, but now View definitely caught out. They can knock back Demon as he's no longer a part of this fight. He can't get it engaged. And Shanks is dead. You got the Baron WE, and you're gonna lose everybody else. Demon as well. Not quite able to keep himself alive. It's all on the Shing. He needs to 1v5. There's one, but no one else will fall. EDG finally get themselves a team fight. And EDG, after what feels like an eternity, should be able to take this 2-0. Man, what an absolute battle. It's going to crest over 43 minutes in this one. And this did not feel like an easy win for EDG. This felt like a constant fight. Shing, the absolute hero for WE, doing everything he could, but it won't be enough. And EDG are going to be able to end this one and claim the 2-0. Scout still unkilled. Fully stacked Medjai's, I believe. And Flandre as well, a monstrous performance on the UNA. EDG get their 2-0, but they have to work for it. They had to sweat. They will get themselves up to 10 wins, and that secures themselves a top six finish. So congratulations to them. But this is what we always say, though, uh, Ox, when we come into these games. There are no easy wins. There are no easy games. And this just proves it. It's our 0 and 12, then 0 and 13 team. You can see EDG, they got the win, but they're not exactly happy with how they got the win. Yeah, I mean, they had to fight for that one. I know, something I do want to say is, you know, these teams who are lower ranked in the standings like WE, it hasn't been a good split for them. They can't go for the playoffs. They're just trying to hunt for the first win. But sometimes you see an individual performance and you think, you know, that player 
maybe maybe on a different roster in a different year different split could really do something i think shing had one of those performances he really stepped up this game i think that's the best yeah. performance i've seen from him probably this year uh just really was and it's such a 1v9 position and it didn't work out eg are you know a formidable team they're currently fifth in the league reigning world champion sure but i can't praise him enough for that performance and making this game so close yeah and look it's it's bittersweet it always is going to be bittersweet for a team like we where you you show so much promise you got to the super late game and it did feel like honestly i'm gonna be i'll be totally honest shane was the better ad carry than over viper in that game shane was just far sure. more confident far more relevant in these fights and, and and very much put viper to the sword in this game but Sadly, you still lose, and because you still lose, it does mean that you're still sitting at zero wins for the split, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an unfortunate loss. But at the same time, EDG still got to give them credit where credits due. They took the mechanical team fights out of the hands of WE, and despite giving up the Baron, they still found the fight afterwards. And it did just feel like it came down to execution right at the end. And I think the solo laners are someone I, I can only gush about for EDG. Oh, yeah. I was a bit critical of Flandre in the laning phase in game one, but game two absolutely on point and scout as well i feel like he just has such a good understanding of how to play leblanc constantly being on those flanks constantly threatening it felt uncomfortable for we just knowing yes. that somewhere out of vision there was this champion who could just one shot you in the blink of an eye meant you could never really feel safe it's like having a rengar who's popped his ultimate ready to jump on you <laughs> you like, see the indicator and you're just like where is he <laughs> yeah and you know i think scout had a fantastic performance there was able to find some great picks but as well often the team fights were cleaned up by this yone pick which you know i want to give credit bringing this yone pick out having such a dominant performance against demon Ended up with a humongous lead and uh, Flandre really piloting it well when it came to those team fights. Often, like, we had that fight where Shing popped off, but it was the solo laners who stayed alive who managed to clean up. Yeah, it did feel like it was about the solo laners in this game. And honestly, I think that for EDG, not the most awe-inspiring of moments there for them kind of going so toe-to-toe -to -toe with we but i think that nevertheless we did see some very good moments there from like you said the solo liners we can only gush about them so so much and this is where we kind of seen the game right now because i feel like the the big difference maker for me in this series was or in this game specifically was those dragons stacking the fact that you can just see the damage building and building and building so so much getting those tw nearly 20 percent extra damage with those infernal drakes it's just absurd. You have to contest them. You can't just let them go by the wayside anymore. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. We didn't get a soul, and yet the impact was there. And I think particularly, like, some dragons, like uh, Cloud Dragon, I feel like is really big early for those early rotations. Ocean is great for laning. But things like Mountain and Infernal, they are those late-game dragons. Percentage off your stats, and Infernal in particular, three of those, when you have Scout with the Medjai's Rabadons, you have Flandre with all that AD from things like Kempok Chainsword, and Viper as well in the city carry, 18% AD is a lot, right? Yeah. Or a AP or AD. It's a sizable chunk. And when you see someone get popped on WE, you can kind of understand, like, that is just a bit too much damage to deal with. Now, we look at the goal graph, and it was definitely a bit of back and forth, but still pretty dominantly in control of EDG. Never really going in favor, but man, Jing, 47.9% of his team's damage. Wow. 238 percent damage per gold if anyone's unclear that basically means like it compares how much damage you did to how much gold you have so you know shake had a lot of gold but he did a boatload of damage yeah it's basically did you get the bang for your buck where you a uh you know did you get scammed by a fake brand or did you get yourself a diamond in the rough and Shing was the 